Today, we're at the Manitoba Legislature, where we're speaking with historian Betty Mueller about one of the suffrage movement's most vocal proponents, Nellie McClung, the activist who helped bring about women's right to vote in Canada. you think was special about Nellie that was able to, she was able to move forward this movement in such a way that perhaps other people weren't able to? Mm-hmm. I can only imagine that there were other people who might have been trying, but Nellie, and, and she didn't do it alone necessarily, but what is it about her that you've sort of mm-hmm. gathered that? Well, I must say that's something I've often wondered, because it seems almost incredible that a person can, at the age of 15, just turned 16, start teaching in a one-room school. And then 10 years later, they're doing recitals throughout Western Canada, at least, and well into Ontario and Toronto, and be, and then become one of the biggest spokespersons for the vote for women. Yeah. So I guess it, it has to be a combination of things. And one certainly is her own intelligence. And I think, secondly, she must have had a marvelous stage presentation. Mm because she was able to capture an audience. She must have been able to think at her feet. Uh, she, I think, gravitated to other people who were similar. And I think she just seemed to always want to get things done. She very much uh, was a voice for the people that didn't have a voice for their own. Yeah. And she was very much, I think, a very much a good community person in a small community. And then she was able to trans for that from Manitou, which was about 800 people, to the biggest city in the area, and probably in the whole prairies at that time. It was, and so yeah. it had to be a combination of determination and intelligence and opportunity, and I think a really good role model in her mother-in-law, mm. and Nellie often mentions her. In fact, some people think Nellie has looked back and decided I could have just chosen my husband based on the mother, his mother. And other people think Nellie really thought that way. Like, is she reading the story from her current time, or right. is she reading it from it was? But she gives her mother-in-law lots of, lots of credit for uh, suggesting that she write, and, and Mrs. McClunk Sr. will stay in her home and look after the four children. So she gave her that freedom to she do it. She gave her that freedom to do it. And in a way, I think she gave her permission, mm-hmm. which is a little bit different in a way, too. She asked her mother-in-law, said, I'll stay and look after the children. You go and get the work done. You go and get your writing started. And then what she had done, sowing seeds in Danny, and was, and was asked to make speeches all over the place, starting in a church in Winnipeg. It was her mother-in-law who asked her to come there to make that speech because her mother-in-law had now moved to Winnipeg and her husband was a minister, and they were involved in a program for girls who um, were homeless. And so she asked Nellie and law to go and give a speech, and the funds would go toward the home. Oh. And from there, other people were asking her to speak. So she does give her mother-in-law a lot of credit, and her mother-in-law was certainly an early suffragist. Um, Nellie mentions in 1992, I think it was, or 1991, she was at a quilting a party or do whatever it is be in a quilting be in a house of one of the people who lived in Manitou, and one of the women said, that "Mrs. McClung is going around taking a petition for the vote for women." 1992, 18, or 18, 18. sorry, in 1892, she took a petition around for the vote for women, and the the women who were at the quilting bee hid, and Nellie said she was the only person who signed the petition. Because Nellie said, if Mrs. McClung thought it was a good idea, it couldn't have been wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what about her husband? Was she was he Nellie's husband? Was he very involved in activism, or or did he support her in that? Or is yes, he... yes, I think he was. He was first of all very involved in in various things. Nellie talks a bit about that in her 
autobiography, but having looked at the local papers of the time, you see his name come up. He served in council at one point. He was involved in various organizations. And of course, they were both involved in the United Church, the Methodist Church at that time. His father was the Methodist minister okay. for some time, for a little time, in Manitou. And he does seem to have supported her. She talks very um, glowingly about the way uh, with the help and, and Wes, things would keep going at home and mm -hmm. uh, it, it didn't seem that their life missed a beat because of this. Yeah. I think he's remembered very fondly in the community and I'm, I'm basing that on what I've read in the older papers. Yeah, no, that's, it sounds... It would make sense because she got seemed to have gotten support from different, uh, whether her husband or her mother-in-law, that seemed to have helped move her forward. It's I the think so. The background. I don't think either of them really thought that they were moving forward. Interesting. I think they were yeah. just doing what, it was almost like Nellie wanted to be a writer, and then all of a sudden there was the opportunity, and she took it, but she didn't kind of push to be a writer, push to be a writer, mm -hmm. and she... Can, could make wonderful speeches, I understand, but her mother-in-law sort of pushed her into that, and then I think Brandon asked her to go and do the same speech there, and she did, and then someone else asked, so it's almost like her talent was discovered and just grew. I it's kind of organically grew because it, people sort of... It seems so, and then I think they went through another phase where Wes had left the drugstore, and she was finding she needed to make some money, and so she made posters and did speeches around the area and around Winnipeg. So she was here in Winnipeg from 1911 and they moved in 1914. Okay. But when they came to Winnipeg, Nellie felt very comfortable in lots of ways. She knew the women of the press club in Winnipeg and these are the people that became the other suffragists along with her. But she had known them earlier and she said the big city just gathered us in. And then they formed the Political Equality League. She was a one of the founders of that, I believe. And it was through that they put on the mock parliament. Yes. And those women just campaigned everywhere. And Nellie was certainly one of them. I was going to say something about the mock parliament. That says a lot about Nellie, but she worked with a group of people to put that on, right? It wasn't just her. Oh, absolutely. And you know, I think you'd find almost everything she did. Now, I'm not including her writing and speaking to uh, engagements earlier, but she did tend to work with a group of people. And they did plan that mock parliament when she was out of the city. I understand, and she came back from whatever campaign she was on, it could have been reading about her books or doing lectures on her books or doing political things or sometimes the same on the stage at the same time and sometimes the next day she tried to do both in tours. But when she came back to Winnipeg, the other people in the Political Equality League had decided they would do the mock parliament and they decided Nellie would be uh, the premier. So, because she uh, was, I think, recognized as the most effective speaker right. of the whole group. So. Most vocal, probably, so she took on that role. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And she did a good job at it, apparently. Well, apparently, because the papers, both local papers, wrote articles on it, and they were very glowing about the whole thing, and also about Nellie's part in it. Okay. And was that what really spurred it forward, the movement, um, that mock parliament? Or was there a kind of a, a few different events that eventually led to the women's right to vote and, and recognize as persons, um, um, which is a sort of a stream of a few different events. Yes, I think the mock parliament really did push the movement on. In fact, they realized they would need to make more money if they were going to carry on the campaign in the province. And so the mock parliament was really an effort to make some money and make the whole thing clearer to those people that hadn't yet realize how important it was for women to have the vote. And they did it with humor. And that's the way Nellie tended to work. But she certainly had the group around her doing that yeah. one. And then as soon as it was over, they continued to campaign. The election was in 1915, and although they were very well recognized, the party, the Liberal Party that they were backing did not win the election. So there was another one. Um, not that long afterwards. And by that time, the McClung family had moved to Alberta. Okay. And Nellie came back and campaigned for the last week before the election. And one of the local papers said that she reached the pinnacle of her career, her, her, her speaking career, her political career. She reached the pinnacle of her career. For yourself, personally, mm -hmm. um, Nellie McClung is, obviously there's been a fascination with her. I think that 
I've had a certain fascination with someone who could have the educational background she had, which was very little in lots of ways. You know, she started teaching at just turned 16. And she did go back for some more teaching training problems, but it's not that she studied the liberal arts and that sort of thing. And yet, I think she could have written some of the books. It's just, I find it very amazing. Yeah. And she just seemed to grow and keep people interested. And it seems to me that her, what drove her was this thing that we can make things better if we just do this. And if we can just keep at it and don't give up. That was a big part of what you talked about. And she also seemed to be like, it's, it's not only right to vote that she, was, that she was pushing for, it also seemed like women's working conditions. And oh, yes. She was a big advocate in terms of that. Is that correct? Was that all sort of tied in in terms of her activism? I think it was. She had taken on so many different you know, roles yeah. as an advocate. Um, it, obviously, women being a primary you know, um, focus, yeah. um, but it's not only the right to vote, women, pre, women as, as people, as persons, uh, working conditions, in fact, mm -hmm. like she seems in the prohibition. I mean, there's just like so many different elements that she has mm -hmm. taken on um, that she's pretty multidimensional in that respect. Oh, absolutely. Well, for instance, she was one of the early advocates of women in the ministry. And because she was a Methodist, she and then the Methodist and, and the Presbyterian churches joined to form the United Church, she went, she was chosen as a delegate to go to their international conference, and she was sure at that time, and I, this would have been in the 20s, I think, the first time she went, she was sure that they would have made a motion for women to be able to be in the pulpit of the United Churches in the country, and they didn't, and she was so disappointed at mm -hmm. that. And disappointed again, I think, in 1934, when they, they didn't allow women to be uh, ministers in the United Church. Mm -hmm. And so she continued to advocate for that, to be an advocate for that. And I think there, if you, if you analyzed everything, yeah. you would probably see that there's a center of women and children mm -hmm. and other people that needed a voice, other people that needed someone to help them and lift yeah. them up and show them the way sometimes or guide them or be guided with them. And I don't think she would ever have thought of herself that way, maybe. But it, it, she, from what I've read, it seems that when she came to Winnipeg, she was horrified in lots of ways mm. by urban poverty. Right. Because rural poverty is a little bit different. I think in rural poverty, you would generally find somebody in the community who's keeping an eye on that person and helping them or that family and bringing them over a cup of tea or sandwiches or leftover food and, and even, if nothing else, providing them with uh, some living quarters that might not be in the big house. But it's so much more individual in a rural area because you know everybody and they're yeah. related to people that you know. And so when she came to Winnipeg and found like a bar in every block and grocery stores selling liquor and the horrible working conditions, especially of uh, women who'd come from foreign countries, and they had no way to make their lives better. Nellie was just horrified and that's one of the first times she went to visit Premier Roblin and took him through the factories. Have you read about that? Well, she and another woman whose name I can't remember, Mrs. It doesn't matter. I could send two if you want to know. That's but um, she and this other woman had um, made arrangements to meet with Premier Roblin mm -hmm. and to show him some of the factories, just hell holes. And he went in with them, and of course, there's people, kids sitting at like big sewing machines and one bathroom for the whole group for the whole day. And one, I think one time you were allowed to get up and leave your work site and Roblin came out and he was just gasping for breath and utterly horrified but he was mostly still... horrified that they would take him there right. not that you know <laughs> yeah from what I understand he was still pretty stubborn in terms of making any change he despite was, seeing the yeah, yeah very stubborn he said to her and, and she says this in her biography and so do her her biographer, she says it in her autobiography, that Roblin said to her, she first of all, oh, after that then, the women in the Political Equality League, I think, mm. wanted to meet with Roblin. Right. And she decided to come herself and have a chat with him. And he was so condescending in that chat, he um, ended up and made that very famous 
quote that he says, um, nice women don't want the vote. And she said something about, well, we'll see about that or some such thing. But he, Nellie said, his voice dripped fatness. <laughs> 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 when she was talking to him at that time. Yeah, they, they didn't really get along so well. Well, not at know. all. I mean, if he had stayed in parliament, in, in government, would you think that women would have gotten the vote? I mean, it seems that he... he no, they wouldn't have. No, no he, he just didn't believe it. And he wasn't alone, because he was the premier. Yeah. And I don't think anyone would be surprised at how he thought. And he did win that next election after the mock parliament. But the if you look at the polling numbers, it was certainly different. Yeah. At that time, they're, they're starting to be on a website. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I've taken a look at them because I, when I first read that, I thought, I guess in my mind years ago, I thought, oh, well, the mock parliament would have made the difference, but then it didn't. But it did make a big difference. I think it probably had, you know, one oh, step at a time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And you see, then they went to the, directly to the Liberal Party after that and said, look, if we campaign for you, will you yeah. get us the vote? But it was a, an astounding change in society, Absolutely. and a lot of women didn't think it was the best thing. Yeah, that's the yeah. interesting part. A lot of women weren't sure. Mm -hmm. um, but thankfully, Nellie disagreed with them too, and she yeah. moved forward, with the other people, obviously. Uh, oh yes, yes, you can't, you can't overlook can't the do. fact that there were earlier suffragists in, in Manitoba. Uh, the Icelandic women, for instance, were very strong in their, uh, their beliefs and their campaigning and there were all kinds of other influences, but I think that Nellie just happened to be the one with that charisma yeah. at the time, which was necessary. certainly would have happened. But every change. They may not have been happens. the first, though. I no, and it may not have happened for a while right. either. Right. But it, yes, she was a remarkable person. I just uh, am amazed when I read about everything she did. Yeah. That's great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you.